Okay, as I'm seeing to tally that off also. Okay, um, personally speaking, for me, um, in all honesty, you're like my hero. Because since I was 13 years old, I've been fascinated with gravity. I told my father that one day I was going to do something with it. I didn't know what. So now here you are. So the, the uh, papers, the research that I've read on the uh, internet about you says that in 1992 is when you first started this experiment or prior to that. So can you, can you, can you elaborate how you started this? I was working at uh, Tampere University of Technology and in fact I was working with uh, high temperature superconductors which are very interesting materials because they can capture the magnetic field of various configurations and they have uh, pretty unusual properties. At that time it was uh, in the center of the attention of all the scientists of the world and I was working with rather big samples uh, with a diameter of maybe uh, six to eight inches which was unusual even at that time and I noticed uh, some uh, anomalous behavior of those superconductors and I noticed that uh, several objects or any objects uh, which were placed over the superconducting disk under uh, the uh, interaction with uh, mag the magnetic fields of high frequency all those objects uh, lost some part of their weight. Uh, we checked and rechecked our experiments before we were brave enough uh, to publish our first article and it appeared in 1992 uh, in the magazine of Physica C. And uh, it was uh, met uh, with great interest by the scientific community. And at that time uh, we used the term mm, gravity shielding uh, because we thought it might be connected really to gravity shielding but later we um, decided not to use that term because it was not right now we use the term uh, gravity modification or to be exact it's the modification of local gravity field and uh, though to be honest we do not know exactly the mechanism of gravity we're only beginning to understand it still we are already able to use it in different um, aspects and uh, for different purposes for scientific industrial and others uh, and we think that uh, this direction has a big future thanks wow that's great that is spectacular okay well that's much better um, you just want to run over to one of just check, see the sun's come out, just make sure we're still good. I'm pretty sure we are. Yep. Yeah. Just want to check. Good. Turn it down. Okay. <coughs> okay. Um, let's see. True, not true. Columns, paper. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, I pulled something off the internet here, and it says that um, originally, now I don't know whether this is true or not, this is the first time I've ever read this particular thing since I've been reading about right. you. It says that uh, it was it was kind of an accident. You were spinning a disc and some smoke. Is, is that true? Was it an accident or? Uh, it was kind of an accident. Hold you there a second. We just got lots of this dust going in front of the uh, lens. It's coming up on the picture. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I'll trust you. I think. Um, all right. We're, we're good now. Okay. Okay, uh, you can say it was uh, practically by accident because we were making our research and we were making the measurements of the weight and we were using a cryostat and uh, we were working late in the evening so one of my colleagues came to the laboratory and he was smoking his pipe and he blew uh, the smoke over the cryostat and then a strange thing happened because that smoke approached the cryostat hit some uh, invisible barrier and then went straight upward. It was a bit unusual but that gave us a very good idea and later uh, we used a barometer in order to uh, check up um, the air pressure over the cryostat and it happened uh, so that uh, the air pressure in the projection area of the disk was uh, lower uh, than in the surrounding atmosphere and the difference was up to several millimeters of uh, 
uh, water or even mercury. So uh, this difference could be felt uh, not uh, only inside our laboratory but on the second floor above us and we were able uh, to show that we really deal uh, with a uh, well reproducible and very um, effective phenomenon. Great. I'm glad I asked you that. Okay, so can we I see. Okay, so can I get you to talk about the disc? Oh. Yes, sure. <coughs> it looks like a weight that, um, that people lift. Okay. Uh, so the disc is made of uh, yttrium barium copper ceramics and it has two layers that is very important from uh, the scientific point of view. So when we put the disc over the magnets and we um, cool it down to the temperature of liquid nitrogen or liquid helium, because of the Meissner effect disc is levitating over the magnets and it can be rotated. And again, with the magnetic field, it can be rotated with big speed. Uh, we use the rotation up to 5,000 uh, rotations per minute, but later we made a special installation which allowed us uh, to use much uh, higher speeds. And uh, every uh, object that is put over the disk loses some part of its weight. In the stationary mode, uh, the loss is not big, it's about uh, uh, 0.1%, uh, uh, but uh, when we rotate uh, the disk and use uh, resonance frequencies of the electromagnetic field, we can increase uh, the weight loss up to 2%, and if we increase also the rotation speed, we can uh, reach the maximum values of 5% and at some peak values up to 9%. Uh, the only thing that keeps us from better result is the rotation speed because the disc is a ceramic one and uh, even at uh, 20,000 rotations per minute we have uh, very big forces which tend to destroy it. So. We should keep it always in mind, but as I used a uh, magnetic uh, suspension system uh, because of the Meissner effect, it's possible to rotate it up to uh, rather high speeds. The maximum that we used was about 30,000 uh, and uh, then we had to uh, make some uh, special protection made of uh, plastic materials uh, so that we could strengthen uh, the structure of the disk. In that case, uh, we get really good values. And uh, also, uh, we have some secrets. Uh, they um, are connected with the resonance frequencies of the magnetic fields uh, and special configuration of the solenoids. But in general, uh, it's a rather um, simple experiment and it can be reproduced uh, in a normal laboratory at any university. Can you see this bit? Yeah, I pulled out and uh, there's a bit of a mic. Uh, I don't care. Yeah. Okay. Um, what do you mean? Yeah. My name is my wife's name. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I'm, I'm thinking about it because I'll forget later. You have a business card. Just so you know. Okay. That's a play okay. on my wife's name. Thanks. Spelled differently. I see. Yes. She's like a sweetheart. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So tell us if that's okay. Um. Now the superconducting material. If it's a secret, that's fine. Uh, but if you're allowed to elaborate on basics uh, of the material. No, it is not secret. Okay. Uh, we have uh, two layers. One layer is. Uh, normal superconductor, or yttrium barium copper, with the formula 1 to 3, it's uh, well known in the world. And the second layer is practically the same material, but it is not superconducting, it is normal conductor. So, uh, by special heat treatment we can arrange uh, both layers in such a way that one layer is superconducting and another is normal conducting layer. 
when we rotate uh, uh, the whole disk in the magnetic field, normal conducting layer um, produces a lot of uh, electrons and they move uh, to the superconducting area and they become uh, not electrons but Cooper pairs. And uh, they form uh, what we call in physics uh, Bose-Einstein condensate, which has uh, unusual properties. Uh, and uh, one of the main properties is that it is it has the property of superfluidity, superconductivity definitely, and it can also interact with subatomic particles that exist uh, around all the objects and. Uh, practically form the whole universe. Uh, and by using this interaction of uh, our superconducting material with uh, subatomic particles, we get very unusual reaction and we can, to some extent, change or modify local gravity field. If we go to a bit deeper physics, uh, we can say that we uh, have the ability to polarize space around this rotating disk and using this uh, polarized uh, space or polarized physical vacuum we can definitely manipulate gravity. I can't say that I'm an expert on gravity. I never was and uh, I'm afraid I never will be. Uh, but I want to uh, understand gravity and to make uh, experimental research in this area because uh, there are a lot of theoretical works and I'm thankful to those theoreticians who uh, also studied our experiments and helped us a lot. But the experimental part still remains, uh, from my point of view, the key point to overcoming gravity and using it for our uh, future, for our purposes, uh, for all our needs. Great. <coughs> um, could you show me with your hands, I mean, I'll probably have a diagram and three three-dimensional uh, animation, yeah. but I think from what I was reading that it looks like donuts. Is that correct? Or yes. Uh, and let them elaborate on that. Okay, go ahead. Uh, if we speak about the magnetic field, yes, it goes like donuts. But uh, if we speak about uh, mm, the production of gravitons, if they ever exist, because uh, these are still hypothetical particles, we have the emission of uh, gravitons, which go follows the projection of uh, this disk, and it goes to space in one direction. And we can uh, uh, change the direction of uh, the flow of gravitons. Or if we are not sure that these particles are gravitons, we can speak about uh, uh, gravity waves which propagate in space and again influence all the objects that are in the projection area of the disk. Now, <coughs> in the disk, is 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 the weight loss in the center or is it run no no uh, we use this configuration because we also have a current which circulates uh, around the disk and it increases the effect and uh, the increase of the effect uh, is because of the fact that we should um, uh, create the maximum density of electrons or Cooper pairs inside the superconducting materials that is the key to success that's why we are rotating it with great speed. That's why we use high frequency. And uh, uh, the result of uh, this density is when a certain uh, critical density of electrons is reached, we have that interaction uh, of uh, Bose-Einstein condensate with the subatomic particles. If we speak about subatomic particles, what I mean? Uh, well, uh, this is uh, a bit... Well, it's not an unusual question in physics. Usually we deal with vacuum, and vacuum, normal vacuum, is considered to be empty, entirely empty. Still, all the transmissions of electromagnetic waves, which go to space, to space, 
shuttles to the moon, uh, they propagate in space and they propagate like waves. And wave is only a distortion of the media. And if vacuum is entire, entire emptiness, there is nothing to disturb, nothing to distort, and then the waves cannot propagate inside it. Also, if we refer to Einstein's theory, he says that gravity is the bending of space-time continuum. It's right, maybe. But if we want to bend something and it is entirely empty, and it is impossible. So we have to admit that there are particles which constitute physical vacuum. These uh, particles are several magnitudes of order smaller than the electron, but they constitute that physical vacuum which has a lot of energy inside and can uh, to some extent uh, interact with uh, normal uh, solid bodies. And the theory of uh, zero-point fluctuations of vacuum was created by um, American scientist uh, Harold Putoff, uh, Bernie Heche and uh, Dr. Roeda. And uh, this theory uh, is a very interesting one. Uh, there are a lot of debates about it, but it's the only theory that is able uh, to explain uh, the mechanism of gravity, the mechanism of energy, and practically how the whole universe was created. It's a new approach. The idea of ether uh, is a, not a new one. It was it existed uh, through centuries, but now it got uh, a very good expression in this theory with good mathematical formulas and. Uh, in my work I try to use uh, this theory. So I am very grateful to uh, Harold Putoff and uh, I'm also grateful to uh, Jack Sarfati who is a kind of his opponent in the scientific world but uh, with different approaches to the same subjects we, um, we can have really the solution of the problem. Also, most uh, of uh, the theoretical work, which is behind my experiments, uh, most of this work was done by uh, Dr. Giovanni Modanese, uh, who is one of the leading European theoreticians in the uh, field of uh, gravity research. And uh, it's enough to say that he made his uh, PhD uh, in Germany and uh, his uh, research was in the field of uh, general relativity and special relativity of Einstein. So we don't break any laws when we are working with superconductors or uh, experimental uh, gravity installations. We are just trying to follow all the rules, but sometimes we observe the um, phenomena which are unusual. We call them anomalous. Uh, and we report honestly what we find. And uh, we would like, of course, uh, to attract the attention of the scientific world to all these problems and uh, to organize uh, a deeper research in this field because it will definitely improve our understanding of the universe, of the creation process, of the gravity forces or gravity field, and it will allow us to use uh, all um, uh, this mechanism for the benefits of humanity. That's great. <coughs> great. Okay, um, now I was reading somewhere where, uh, and of course you mentioned, if a disk spins faster, I guess you get more of a feel around it. If you were to say have a disk made of that material, and if it were possible to spin it, would you? I'm trying to figure out how to phrase this. Um, and if you were to say spin it, the, I'll, I'll use this to say 6,000 RPMs, a uh, disk maybe say three feet, would it actually be able to levitate more objects or, or more weight, or is it 
something else at work here. Well, uh, first of all, if we rotate a such big disk at uh, terrible speeds, it will fall apart because the materials can't uh, stand uh, this load. But uh, to be absolutely honest, now uh, after 12 or 15 already years of research in this field, uh, we came to a conclusion that it is not necessary to use superconducting materials in order to modify uh, the gravity field. We can use rotating magnetic fields and we can turn to normal conductors, which is much easier, much easier and uh, uh, this method uh, has a lot of advantages. So we use superconductors just as modal materials because we can put different magnetic fields inside and we can freeze magnetic fields inside the material. So this is just the unique properties of the superconductors that we used. So it's possible still uh, to base the research on superconductors, but we can go further. And in order to create flying vehicles or impulse gravity generators, we can use normal materials. <coughs> okay, um, have you ever tried, <coughs> I was reading something about NASA, they've got an experiment that they evidently released, um, I guess weeks ago, um, they haven't released it or somehow it got into the, on, on the internet that I read about it, but they have something that's 20 inches wide by 48 inches tall, and I guess it's like a tube from the, the uh, description of it. Um, if you were to stack those discs, would you get more power? Uh, say able to. I, I, I guess what I'm trying to get at is, could you lift heavy objects like I don't know, bricks or you know? Well, if we put uh, uh, one disc over another, and they can't be put just like this, we use different cryostats, and we can. Uh, rotate the disk even in opposite directions. Yes, there is some uh, gain in the weight loss, so it's possible. Uh, the experiments that were made uh, in NASA, according to my knowledge, uh, they uh, used the principles that uh, I published in uh, Physica C in 1992. And then uh, we modified the experiment and used uh, bigger disks, so um, I consulted people from Marshall Space Flight Center uh, uh, on this topic and they got some unusual results but unfortunately the whole uh, uh, the whole project which was called uh, breakthrough propulsion uh, system uh, it lost practically all the funding and uh, uh, the research was stopped at the final uh, point uh, they made the cryostat, uh, they made the disks uh, very close to the requirements that um, we supplied, and uh, we were ready for the tests, but the program was stopped, unfortunately. And that is quite understandable, because uh, this research is entirely new, and uh, by the way, it doesn't require much money. And usual approach to gravity problems, to rockets, to shuttle programs, all these things take lots of money and uh, that also means that a lot of people are involved. They have working places uh, and the companies get millions from this. Uh, but finally what we get as a result is a shuttle which is not a reliable construction at all. And it was good for the 20th century but it is not good for the 21st. We have better proposals, we have cheaper variants, and we have more efficient solutions for the exploration of space. So I was always hoping uh, to be able to organize um, the Institute for the Gravity Research uh, based on the best physicists of the world. It might be under the guidance of NASA or European Space Agency or Russian Space Agency or British Aerospace, whatever it is, but it should be international because the problem is too complicated to solve it only in the United States or in France or in Russia. Mm. If you were to... Uh, the smoke that, you, that the, your colleague blew over that 
is it possible to see the actual rings that go around? Is there some way of looking at that? No, no, it's uh, the smoke simply approach this area and then it goes up mm -hmm. and that's all. And uh, my poor colleague, I usually, I, I can't even tell his name because unfortunately, and everybody knows it, it is not allowed to smoke in the lab, <laughs> but it was evening time and he was uh, exhausted and he was going home and he was just curious what we were doing so late. That's why he, uh, so I'm always asked, do you know that it is not allowed to smoke in the lab? Yes, I know it very well. We never smoke. We usually don't break any laws, administrative or physical. We're just very intelligent people. I didn't know that, so oh, God. I don't want to get you in trouble. Okay, uh, okay, so what would happen if you... <clears throat> okay, here's something I, I, I was wondering. Have you ever... I don't know how you get the disc to, to a spin. Maybe you got an electric motor under it or something. But if you were to put a pan of water, maybe two inches thick, maybe two feet by two feet, would it have any effect on the water? Would, would the water... I mean, could it, could, it, could it possibly bring water up? Is that possible? Uh, well, what will happen that uh, all water that is put over the disk will lose some part of its weight. So, if we put one liter of water, it will uh, weigh not one kilo, but 2% uh, less, or 1% less. That's all. Mm. We can't uh, use this uh, method for the uh, turbines or for the production of energy at present. But I'm sure that based on this principle we can uh, later uh, construct the installations which will be able to provide us not with entirely free energy but with the energy which is very cheap and very efficient. If we speak about free energy, again I don't want to break the second law of thermodynamics, but the second law of thermodynamics is valid only for closed systems and it is well known to every physicist. But they always forget that we deal with physical vacuum. That means the subatomic particles that are present everywhere in the air, inside this body, inside human tissues. And we can take the energy from this field of physical vacuum and we can use this energy. But how to organize the interaction uh, with this uh, physical vacuum? It's another question. So there are various approaches. And uh, there, is, there are pages on the net which are called American Anti-Gravity. And it's mm, a very mm, big work by Tim Ventura. And I uh, have a small abstract there. And there are different ways uh, to polarize space and to uh, have the interaction with physical vacuum, we can uh, create high magnetic fields, we can create high electric fields like uh, Byfield-Brown effect, we can also uh, have extra low frequencies uh, and uh, here it's necessary to mention uh, the works of Professor Fran de Aquino from Brazil and it's also possible to use um, rotating magnetic fields based on the works of Professor Searle from Great Britain. We can also uh, rotate uh, normal uh, gyroscopes and uh, I'm always thankful to Professor Laithwaite uh, who slightly disturbed uh, the traditions of um, the science in Britain but still proved that we can create gravity forces, use uh, special gravity forces use, uh, using uh, usual gyroscopes. And we can also uh, use special grids, very thin grids, uh, and topological effects in order to polarize space. And we can, of course, use uh, superconducting materials and the properties of Bose Einstein condensate. And there are also some other methods. Uh, we know some of them and we know um, and maybe we don't know all of them but uh, there is a big field uh, of 
um, unstudied material in front of us. But we can also use the combination of all these methods and uh, this will definitely give uh, the best results. So we are slowly moving in these directions using the knowledge of different scientists uh, from other countries, using theoretical material that, is, uh, that exists in this area, but uh, also using intuition because we are pioneering uh, this work and uh, this task is extremely difficult because modern science it's like whole inquisition we can't say we invented or we made anti-gravity by the way we never use the term anti-gravity in our laboratory we use gravity forces which can be attractive and which can be also repulsive and by the way if uh, and uh, superconducting material um, can demonstrate uh, both repulsive and attractive forces. For example, if we have a superconductor and we have a magnet and we put the magnet over the superconductor and cool the whole system down, then we take the magnet off and the superconducting disk follows it. And we can rotate it just by hand and it will continue rotating under the magnet. So we have the magnetic uh, field which scientists say is frozen inside the superconductor. Well, the word frozen, the word frozen is not quite acceptable. This is a very interesting phenomena, uh, practically same as uh, levitation, uh, but the mechanism of uh, all these things and the flux and the properties of uh, the electrons these things are not studied in detail, they are not understood in detail, and even the mechanism of superconductivity, high temperature superconductivity, is not established, and Nobel Prize is still waiting for the scientists who will give us the direct explanation of the mechanism of superconductivity. So it just uh, proves that the subject is too difficult and uh, too unusual to work alone or with a small team. We need the efforts of the international community. That's the key to success. That's great. Um, <coughs> uh, NASA has uh, an, ion, an ion propulsion system. Are you aware of that? That, that, that? that particular system, they've got Deep Space One and Deep Space Two. Yes. Now that are being propelled by that. Uh, have you ever experimented uh, with using gases, maybe like a xenon gas, um, spinning, the, you know, a, a xenon gas per, per perhaps? Uh, if we speak about propulsion systems, uh, I think that I it's uh, better to refer uh, to another step of our work, which is called impulse gravity generator. And uh, this work attracted uh, not only the attention of NASA, but also the attention of Boeing, and uh, Boeing uh, Phantom Works in particular. They have a special research in this field. Uh, so if we uh, refer to this field, uh, this is a bit different, but based practically on the same mechanism. So we again have a superconducting disk. Uh, which is made of two layers, but uh, uh, thermal treatment and chemical composition is a bit different, so we have a different crystal structure. And we organize um, a, a high voltage uh, discharge through this superconductor. And uh, it's a very unusual experiment. I think nobody in the world ever repeated it. Uh, so we use the principle of the Van der Graaff generator and we have uh, the difference of voltages close to 2 million. Uh, we have superconducting material uh, which is cooled and the whole system is in the vacuum chamber and during the discharge, uh, again uh, in the magnetic field, during the discharge the superconducting material emits gravitational wave or uh, a portion of gravitons which propagate in space uh, with extremely big speed and are able to uh, uh, provide some pressure or interact with the materials 
uh, in the area uh, in the projection area of this impulse so this interaction is um, very short in time it's uh, femtoseconds uh, or um, well, let's say uh, one million of a second and uh, uh, we have uh, uh, this impulse which hits the subjects or all the objects in the projection area and propagates uh, um, further not losing any energy at least measurable energy so uh, we began uh, these experiments about six years ago and our first article uh, was published uh, on the net uh, in the year 2000 and this is uh, the theoretical basis of this work was uh, done by uh, Dr. Giovanni Modanese and this is a very serious research and uh, it has extremely uh, good potential because uh, this gravity impulse uh, is able to propagate with the speeds close to 64 C which is 64 times uh, faster uh, than the uh, speed of light but uh, we have no limitations because we don't uh, work with any material objects uh, they practically have no mass and uh, uh, this impulse is able to interact with light. Uh, we mm, uh, made uh, rather interesting research. The results were published in the um, uh, magazine of uh, uh, it's the Journal of Low Temperature Physics uh, in August of 2003. And again, it's with uh, Dr. Modanese. So this is another application of uh, high temperature superconductors uh, and their discharge and uh, the force of the discharge uh, can be um, uh, can be uh, rather strong at first we uh, were able only to um, work with the pendulums and uh, just uh, only the best thing that we uh, were able to do was to push a thick book away from the table uh, it was standing uh, just a vocabulary uh, but now when we started uh, uh, and we were working with this program for several years and I have a very good team uh, we were able uh, to increase the power of this beam uh, so now it can bend metals uh, rather uh, thick plates and it can uh, create holes in fragile materials uh, such as bricks or mm, cement or ceramics uh, and again uh, if we uh, say honestly do we understand in details the mechanism how it works not everything if not everything at all uh, but we are working on it and for the purposes of uh, space research and uh, for the communication uh, very fast communication we can definitely use this uh, impulse gravity generator and we should also uh, study uh, these effects uh, using different approaches and uh, the most uh, complicated the most uh, precise equipment uh, that uh, we have that we have available in the world but we, we were measuring the uh, propagation speed of the impulse we used a two atomic clock and we had the distance of um, slightly over than one kilometer so we repeated these results several tens of times and uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, we got uh, very exact values still knowing the reaction of the scientific community or what we call politically correct science we are a bit uh, afraid to publish the results openly but sooner or later we will have to do it and we are absolutely sure and uh, again I want to repeat that we have no intention to break any laws and if we sp sometimes people say Oh, Dr. Patkletnev, you are trying to break uh, the Einstein's law, and I want, uh, even with the rotating disks, and I want to remind one more time that Einstein's theory of relativity is good when we speak about relative motion. So every normal motion 
is relative. But if we speak about the rotation about of the object around its own axis, it's not relative motion, it's absolute motion. And the theory of relativity is not applicable to absolute motion. So please, leave Dr. Einstein aside. That's great. Okay, um, what's the future? Okay, so obviously you've worked with NASA a bit. Um, what, what practical applications do you foresee uh, the future for this knowledge here? For instance, uh, vehicles instead of on the, on the road, are they up three feet off the ground, moving around, are they space travel? Does this answer any questions of um, black holes, you know, things of that nature? Well, uh, I can't say anything about black holes. Uh, because uh, um, it's uh, a separate topic and uh, again I'm not an expert on this but uh, if we speak about uh, new propulsion systems definitely these gravity effects can be uh, used uh, and even at present the knowledge that we have uh, if applied properly Mm, can result in uh, very efficient uh, propulsion systems close to what we call UFOs. Uh, well, in fact, uh, I want to believe uh, that they exist and uh, I have nothing against. I have never seen one in my life. But uh, from the experience that we have, it's possible to make uh, the objects that will propagate in space using modification of local gravity field, using polarization of vacuum, and there are a lot of good theoretical works in this field, and also a lot of practical works. But somehow this is a forbidden area, maybe because uh, there are some traditions in physics, uh, maybe because uh, there are some contradictions. Uh, also, mm, military uh, organizations are always interested in this. Uh, and uh, uh, simply, uh, if we speak about uh, anti-gravity platforms or lifters or whatever it is, people say there are some contradictions with physical laws. Well. There are some contradictions, but if we compare uh, quantum mechanics, which is a well-established science in physics, and general relativity, there are enormous contradictions between these two theories, which contradictions in formulas, in understandings, in basics, and the whole scientific world closes the eyes they don't want to mention it. And by, by the way, th this does not uh, keep people from using both uh, effects. For example, we use uh, Einstein's uh, approach in atomic bombs, and we use uh, uh, quantum mechanics for all electronics and for our portable phones, and both things work but they have contradictions in theory and these contradictions are really great. So let's not be afraid of contradictions. It's quite normal. Simply we don't understand uh, physics well enough. And uh, this is the science which uh, uh, should... Uh, it's a subject to evolution. So new ideas, new understanding, deeper knowledge, that comes with every year. And at present we have good theories and in various uh, countries there are scientists who are working in the field of experimental gravity research and uh, I think it's good to pay attention to those works because the future of our civilization and the future of modern physics will be in this area and it's absolutely clear now. You know <coughs> I'd like for you to repeat on camera the quote you typed me. I love it. It was, uh, you said something like, uh, 
the one who controlled gravity will control the world? Uh, well, there are uh, some good sayings. Uh, uh, also, gravity will set us free, but freedom is only for those people who think differently. And so we are trying to think differently, and I think we'll succeed in our research. And the history of science proves it, because we had normal phones, then uh, cell phones, and uh, we had uh, primitive calculating machines, now we have computers, now we go to space, and practically there are no limits unless these limits are created artificially and that's the thing which I'm afraid of and there is one more saying that uh, you know, one more uh, interesting thing uh, people should approach all uh, new changes and all new research fields with open mind because a mind is like a parachute it only works when open that's great Um, have you, maybe you guys haven't come across it yet, but, and this could be like a very quick answer, when I think spinning, does it cause any kind of radio interference? If you had a radio playing, would it create No, static? no. Uh, this uh, installation doesn't produce any bad effects, but if we speak about impulse gravity generator, we put a Faraday cage over the installation, otherwise, uh, all the, the computers in the surrounding area will be burned. So there are some still unexplored uh, fields which accompany these effects and we notice them. Mm. <coughs> these questions that you wrote down here, do you know what they are specifically? <coughs> um, I can run it. One thing that I wanted to ask, I don't know if it's, um, it might be uh, kind of off bounds as well, but you're saying that you're using different materials now. Um, as opposed to the superconductors, like normal materials, um, what would they be? Sorry, I'm trying to uh, wait a second. You know what, actually it's fine. It's, it's, it's something like out. Go ahead. Uh, I just uh, wanted to emphasize that it is not necessary always to use uh, superconducting materials uh, for the gravity research, but these materials are very good as modal materials. We can uh, practically create whatever magnetic fields we want and uh, use the properties of Bose-Einstein condensate. As far as we understand um, uh, how uh, the system works, we can move to normal materials because uh, the key to uh, polarizing space is also rotating magnetic fields uh, which work in uh, a certain uh, resonance cycle and uh, in order to create these conditions, we don't need superconductors, we just need normal materials. Okay. I think we pretty much covered this, but I was just wondering on like, um, this is more for like uh, getting down on the layman side of things. Um, and kind of going back to like the applications and implications of your work, um, but do you see it? Um, what kind of what kind of a, like the vehicles of the future and the weapons of the future and things like that that may come through this? Or, uh, 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 well, first of all, I'm a scientist. I'm not a military person, and I try to uh, keep uh, the results of uh, the research of my team and of my colleagues on the net. It's open to everyone and uh, I'm ready uh, to have um, scientific and industrial contacts with any organization that is interested in this uh, research and in, this methods, in these methods. But definitely uh, everything can be used for military purposes, uh, the planes, the UFOs if we build one, uh, gravity impulse generator, but they can also be used uh, for the purposes of defense. And uh, if we speak about uh, different uh, space bodies that approach Earth with big speed, or um, if we speak about uh, drilling, uh, uh, 
to very um, deep uh, level inside the earth if we speak about um, propagation system if we speak about communications so there can be different um, applications military scientific medical technical uh, whatever you say great great that's perfect um, I was just wondering as well um, what are the general criticisms or like um, I don't criticism isn't necessarily the right word but what are the things you generally come up against with your peers the, um, with this theory because obviously it's a groundbreaking uh, theory what are the things that kind of um, uh, challenge people the most uh, frankly speaking I don't I've never met any serious uh, scientific opposition in this field uh, because first of all uh, these results are mm, unique at present only several laboratories in the world uh, tried some uh, simplified approach to the same problem but uh, people who worked in this uh, area for uh, several years or who contacted me uh, they are convinced that uh, we are not creating any new science. We are just uh, opening the pages which were not open before us. Of course, some people say you go against Newton, you go against Einstein, and then these are usually the professors of physics. And then we have a very interesting discussion. And I say, please, uh, Professor, could you tell me what exactly we are talking about? And after half an hour or even 10 minutes of discussion, uh, we came to a conclusion that uh, most of the professors of physics they did not study the works of Einstein nor the works of uh, Sir Isaac Newton uh, I'm not an expert uh, on their works but I spent uh, several weeks at the library of the British Museum in London and I studied the works of Sir Isaac Newton in the original the language is a bit different but quite understandable and uh, uh, I'm not very good at German though I can read but I used all the translations uh, from mm, the works of Einstein and his lectures and his books and his articles and I found that a lot of things uh, my experiments the experiments of my team they prove a lot of theoretical statements that were made by Newton or Einstein and people who want to criticize me they practically um, have no background in this field so um, I was just wondering um, it's kind of a, not that direct a question but obviously um, you've had the interest from NASA that have approached you um, is this something that worldwide everyone's interested in or are you having to kind of really push the point to uh, get people excited well uh, uh, NASA is interested definitely uh, British Airspace uh, is interested uh, people in France are interested there is enormous interest from China because they have very good theoreticians in this field and uh, they are building uh, slowly but surely uh, the research program in this field uh, there are certain difficulties even for people who are working in this area because if we, are, uh, if we sp discuss the problems of gravity or anti-gravity it's like a red flag people become excited uh, they <laughs> uh, it's too unusual to take it openly because for many years uh, these topics were shown only in the scientific literature or uh, science fiction and also in some films so uh, now we need a very good uh, scientific analysis of the situation and uh, we need to accept uh, experimental gravity research as one of the uh, leading fields in physics that is important even in NASA, you know, NASA is a very conservative organization, much more conservative than British Aerospace. A lot of people are working there, they are normal engineers, rather good engineers, but they have also assistant directors and managers who
who would like to continue um, their work in NASA uh, for several years more and uh, they are not flexible. They try to base their research even with uh, International Space Station and Shuttle program uh, on the technology of nuts and bolts and that's not the way to explore space and uh, the President of the United States, Mr. Bush, uh, made an excellent uh, program for NASA uh, and uh, he made an interview on the TV uh, concerning the exploration of deeper space. Everything was right, but one thing was missing. They don't have the technology which allows this exploration. So the, the best thing to do is to concentrate on the modern aspects of physics on experimental gravity research and to put even 5% of funding which is available for the International Space Station to this research. And in that case, in 10 years, we can get a new flying vehicle which will fly all over the globe and even to deeper space. Hold on a second. I'd like to use my tape. Ah. Do you have to change your tape? Yeah. Yeah, I've got, right, I'll just go through one more. I was, um, I was just wondering if you could elaborate on um, Eric Lathwaite's gyroscopes and his um, results in mass transfer. Okay, just a couple of, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Previous. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I don't want to criticize uh, NASA people, they're uh, hardworking people and they're determined, definitely. But uh, the administration of NASA uh, has, in my point of view, poor understanding what should be done. And uh, I have uh, my greatest respect uh, for John Glenn, the first American uh, astronaut and uh, the former member of the U.S. Congress. And uh, he uh, supported with all his forces uh, the uh, breakthrough propulsion system research and the research which uh, was begun with uh, superconductors. And each time he came to Marshall Space Flight Center, he was met uh, with joy and with respect and people promised everything and he is a very wise uh, person. He understands what uh, the future is about. But then he left uh, and uh, the research uh, was slowly uh, stopped and now it is practically at zero point and uh, sometimes people uh, still remember John Glenn and said, oh, he wanted this research to be continued. But then modern administration say, John Glenn, he's a very old guy. He can hardly understand what is going on. It's their mistake. He understands perfectly what is going on. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so um, I was just wondering a bit about Bill um, Eric Lathwaite's uh, mass transfer and his linear motor. How that, um, so, like, especially his gyroscopes and the mass transfer, how that relates to um, how that kind of helped your you and that, how that kind of uh, related to your. Uh, as I already mentioned, uh, uh, he was working uh, with uh, absolute motion. That is the uh, fast rotation of the massive body around its own axis and it's possible uh, also to use the rotation uh, around two axes. Mm. So uh, it's a good approach uh, and uh, uh, when he demonstrated his uh, findings uh, at uh, London uh, uh, Imperial College where he worked it was a sensation and everybody could see how he was uh, holding a very heavy uh, gyroscope on his finger and uh, the gyroscope was about 25 kilos and he was holding it uh, on his finger and he was not a very strong man but quite a usual professor and uh, it's a measurable effect which can be repeated which can be used uh, but unfortunately I think two months after he demonstrated uh, this effect. He was fired 
from this uh, prestigious university, and they continue their own line. Uh, Professor Laitwaite uh, went to the United States, but uh, and he organized a nice research there. But unfortunately, he got ill, and soon after that, uh, he passed away. So, uh, but that's one more uh, proof that uh, how difficult it is to work in this area. Because modern science is like whole inquisition. That's why I am a bit afraid. Um, my last one or so, I mean, I'll keep on having a last one. Mm -hmm. uh, just again for the layman, I was wondering if you could uh, describe the term zero point. Uh, zero point energy. Or, well, it's, uh, uh, let's say it in simple words. Uh, we deal with normal bodies. Uh, body can be solid, gas, liquid, and plasma. But we also deal uh, with subatomic particles which have uh, their size uh, 40 uh, orders of magnitude smaller than the electron and there are various kinds of these uh, particles they have their own laws of energy of mechanical motion of uh, superfluidity of pressure and of uh, let's say coherence because uh, we can speak about um, scalar fields, we can speak about coherent vacuum. Uh, it's becoming a bit complicated, I understand, but we can deal with these uh, subatomic particles. They form the ether or the fundamental particles uh, and the whole universe is made of these particles. So it's possible to extract energy from this sea, from this ocean of particles. It's possible uh, to um, navigate inside uh, uh, this media. It's possible uh, to create wormholes. It's possible to travel with a speed uh, much more than the speed of light. Because the laws which govern these uh, subatomic particles are different. We are, now, we are now only approaching the stage where we can understand or analyze these laws they are still not known to us. But nothing stops us from studying them and gravity research should be one of the first in this field because it's important for our civilization, important for our future. Well, anyway, it's good to have a flying saucer instead of the car just parked near your balcony. It's and it should be silver, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I've got a question here. Um, okay, um, is there anything, <clears throat> okay, man a long time ago looked to the sky and he saw a bird flying and he said, I'd like to be able to do that. So he had a model, he had something to build or to idealize, to dream about, to want to fly. Um, is there anything that you know about on the planet besides the, the uh, disk? It could demonstrate um, anti-gravity, well, we don't want to say anti-gravity, we want to say gravity manipulation. Uh, there are different places on Earth uh, where uh, we have uh, gravity anomalies. There are some places in, in the United States. Uh, uh, there are some places in Britain. There are some places in other countries. Sometimes they are situated uh, on the land, sometimes on the sea surface, and uh, from time to time these areas become active. Well, we know about Bermuda Triangle, uh, lots of science fiction uh, things written about these areas, but we also know about different crashes of uh, airplanes and uh, Uh, they happen in different parts of the world. So there are some theories which uh, prove that uh, some mm, parts of our globe have, mm, uh, anom mm, have anomalies in um, gravity properties, in the properties of magnetic fields, electric fields, and uh, when the Earth is rotating around itself and around 
the sun, uh, these areas become active in a certain order. And then we have very unusual effects, because uh, if we turn to the statistics of air crashes, sometimes when the plane, uh, plane crashes, it travels about uh, half a kilometer or one kilometer, or about a mile on the surface, which is understandable, but sometimes the plane crashes and it gives the exact print on the land. And it can be explained only by anomalies in the gravity field. And the Earth still contains a lot of puzzles which we do not know, but which should be studied. So this is if we refer to nature, but also we live in the artificial world and we can we have artificial means and we have even now enough knowledge to make experiments in this field. And these experiments are needed because each time I see the shuttle going to space, I understand that it is a very big bomb going to space and a very big risk for the astronauts. That's why applying new propulsion systems and the systems which allow to operate with gravity forces, we can make those trips much safer, much uh, easier and uh, uh, less expensive than the existing programs. Also, if we deal with uh, energy production, these new methods will allow us to extract energy from different sources and to stop that uh, the use of oil, which in my understanding should be used not for the, uh, for the vehicles, but only for chemistry, uh, new plastic materials, or something of this kind. I agree with that. Oh, okay. I want to show you real quick. I was just thinking, did you did you cover the um, the way that like uh, in future like interstellar exploration? Obviously, you use the gravitational pull of different planets uh, to give you a lot of your uh, propulsion. <coughs> but how would um, a gravitational manipulation device work? Would you have to kind of a, like a, see where the nearest uh, gravitational field is and like take planets as you go past them or I don't I don't kind of understand myself uh, I don't know if you could expand on that well uh, I have some projects uh, which were created in collaboration with uh, and some drawings uh, uh, in collaboration with my American colleagues and my colleagues from uh, Italy from Great Britain, from Russia, and from China, uh, also from Canada. Sorry, I forgot. And uh, uh, it's possible uh, uh, to use Biefeld Brown effect, uh, which is a kind of uh, electrostatic propulsion, and uh, to use uh, the phenomenon uh, which we call the polarization of space. Uh, when we create the polarization of space uh, in under the conditions of normal uh, Earth, that means that we create a kind of a gravity well. And all the subjects, uh, all the objects that are close to this area, they will fall into this well. So uh, we uh, observe this phenomena as a UFO or any flying disk which goes uh, up, but in fact, uh, speaking uh, in uh, physical terms, that means that this object is falling inside a gravity well. So this is about uh, how we can propagate uh, close to the Earth. If we speak about other planets, uh, it's a bit early now to discuss uh, how it can be done, but uh, using the same principle polarization of space and uh, uh, a possibility uh, to move in the media of uh, subquantum particles, everything is possible. But as I mentioned, uh, first of all, I am not an expert on gravity. Second thing, I'm not a magician. I'm just learning. Maybe I will become one. Pull this back, guys.